kind of what I would say are the three major factors that affect engagement. And when I'm talking about engagement, what I mean by that is, are your students listening and not just listening, and, but are they involved in class? And by involved in class, I don't mean raising their hand and asking questions because if you've been teaching for any length of time, you know you're gonna have that shy kid where if anything, for them to raise their hand and ask a question or for you to call on them can actually cause them to become unengaged because their anxiety is gonna go through the roof and they're just gonna check out. And so even for that quiet kid, they may not be asking questions, they may not be talking, but they're engaged. And so every student, what that looks like looks a little bit different, but it means they're, they're with you and they're tracking with you in the lesson and they are actively learning. Um, and so that's kind of how I define engagement, that the students are with you, tracking with you, and they are actively learning. And so let's look at the three things that affect that. So like I said, what is engagement? The three factors. So in any classroom, there are three things going on. There's you and what you're doing. There's the individual student and what they're doing. And then there's the class as a whole. And the class as a whole, I don't necessarily mean your classroom in that environment. I mean the period, you, the group of kids you have, that period. Um, you know, we've all had it throughout our teaching career. We've had that, that one group of kids who gave us gray hairs um, and just makes me kind of cringe even thinking about some of them. Where, you know, it's just a group of kids that you kind of wonder what the people who are scheduling were thinking. Like you put them and them together, why? I have five sections, spread them out, please. <laughs> um, something like that. Um, or we've had those sections where, you know, those classes where we've had perfect, you know, just really studious, on task, easy class periods. And so the class period also affects things and how we do dynamics. And when we look at these three factors, it's important for us to realize something important, and that is this. Which of these do we control? Um, we have control over us as teachers. We have control over what we're doing with our time and how prepared we are. And, and these other, are we using these other strategies we're gonna look at to help the kids be actively with us in the learning process? And we're gonna look at those other strategies. Are we implementing those strategies? Are we making our classroom a safe place for them to struggle with the learning process? You know, where it's okay to say, I don't know and I don't understand. Um, all those things are, are in our control, what we can do. We can control our classroom environment. You know, what do we have on the walls? Is it distracting? Um, how are we writing on the board? Are we using PowerPoints? What are we doing? Those things are in our control for us. For our students and for the class as a whole, we really don't have all that much control. Um, I can't make Susie study. I can't make Susie get enough sleep the night before so she's not falling asleep in my classroom. I can't make Johnny, you know, not have a fight with his best friend the period before he walks into my room or break up with, with his girlfriend the night before. Whatever the case may be, I don't have control over those things for students. And I don't have control over how they schedule my class. Um, I can control the seating chart. Um, but, you know, you've had those classes where there's no such thing as a good seating chart because you can't ever get all the bad kids away from each other or the bad kids, what's not, you know, kids that give me issues. Um, I try not to call them bad, because I try not to label them, because that makes it sound like they're always going to be bad, and they don't have to be. Um, and we'll look at that kind of as we go along, too. And so we've all run into those kind of things. We don't have control over those things. What we do have control over, though, with both individual students and with the class as a whole, is how we respond. How do we respond to them? How do we treat them? You know, when we've got that quiet kid, what do we do with that child to help draw them out? If we have a kid who's just really, really weak at chemistry, how do we pull them along? And, you know, that kid, kid that comes in and says, I can't do math. I can't do chemistry. You know, what are we going to do with that kid to draw them along and get them engaged in the learning process? You know, what are we going to do with that troublemaker? You know, or sorry, that kid who's having a hard day that day. You know, they don't have to be troublemakers. I'm, I, I'm trying to catch myself in my own language because the language we use expresses the beliefs we have. And if I believe a kid's always gonna be a troublemaker, I'm gonna always treat them that way. And there's gonna be no hope for them to change. Um, but if I treat them as you know, a person who's acting out for some reason, and I can be curious about that and, and work with them, that's 
part of what I talked about in the last uh, workshop about classroom management and being curious about kids um, and drawing them out and drawing them into a relationship where we can stop being troublemakers and start being an active part of my classroom. You know, that's my goal. That's what I want out of those kids. So the other thing we need to look at is what I call the three enemies of classroom engagement. Um, confusion. If a kid is confused, if a kid says, I don't understand, or this is too hard, that's a red flag. It's a red flag that their ability to engage and be with us is being threatened. Because if that continues on for too long without us addressing it, eventually the kid's gonna check out. Eventually the kid's gonna say, what is the point? I can't do this. You know, so I'm just gone. You know, they're gone for the rest of the chapter or they're gone for the rest of the year. And you've lost their engagement. You've lost their ability to be with you actively learning in class because they got too confused. And so it's up to us to, when we see confusion, to be like, well, you know, be on alert and do something about it. Take action. And we're going to kind of look at some ways that we can take action. All right. Um, other thing about confusion is that's the one probably more than any of the other two that can really lead to creating anxiety. And when we get anxious, you know, if it gets bad enough, we enter into that whole fight or flight mode. And the prefrontal cortex, that front part of your brain that is so responsible for your higher order thinking skills and your problem solving, that begins to shut down when kids get into fight or flight mode, when they get that confused and that anxious. And so that makes learning almost impossible, at least learning chemistry, because it's pretty technical. Um, and so we've got to really be aware of those things. Second big enemy is boredom. Um, for me, most of the time, I don't find chemistry to be that boring of a class to teach. Every now and then I run into lessons that are inherently boring, like um, the history of quantum mechanical model. Not all that exciting and a little abstract and hard for kids to follow. Uh, periodic trends I don't find very exciting. Um, those things just don't get me all that excited. And, and so sometimes your kids are going to be bored, and that's okay. What's a problem is when there's consistent boredom. Uh, it generally means you're going too slow and you're gonna start losing those kids. And that's what happens when we start having to reteach and do all these different things when our bright kids have already gotten it and they're having to sit through me reteaching it again for the third time. And we're gonna kind of look at strategies once again to try to help keep everybody together as we go along so that our bright kids don't face boredom and check out. All right, uh, third one is distraction. You know, when kids are distracted, they're not paying attention. If they're distracted, they're not going to be actively learning. That's just the reality of it. Um, cell phones. But cell phones aren't that, I mean, they're kind of a big deal, but that's also things like they've got a big test in U.S. history next period. They've got a pep rally later in the day. They've got, um, they just had a fight with their friend the period before. Once again, these are things that we can be aware of. And some of these distractions we can get ahead of. And we'll kind of look at some strategies for dealing with distractions. Um, and I also talked about it last week in the classroom management of how to deal with non-behavior issues and how to get ahead of them and kind of deal with the elephant in the room in such a way as to really minimize the impact of those distractions. Because all three of these are going to show up. You know, your kids are going to get confused. They're going to get bored. They're going to get distracted. What do we do when we see them? That's the issue. Um, just because they show up doesn't mean we're some horrible teacher. They just, they show up. They're part of teaching. And so the question is, how are we going to take action and address them? So let's look at some things that I want you to consider now. Cause I really, I've got like 11 different strategies and I can't get through all 11 of them in the time that we have. And so I'm going to kind of focus on some now in a little more depth. Okay. So for me, the beginning of the year, and if you sat through any of my workshops, you've heard this term, student-driven pacing. Even right now, um, I'm not in the high school classroom anymore, but if I were to walk into a chemistry classroom, I would know, all right, I wanna be through these chapters in the first quarter, I wanna be through these in the second quarter, and then third quarter, fourth quarter. I kinda of have the year mapped out roughly in my head at the beginning of the year. But I don't have is exactly how long it's going to take. I have an idea how long each unit should take, but it's gonna flex a little bit every year. Sometimes I get really bright kids and I can go faster. Sometimes I get really weak kids and I gotta go slower. Sometimes I have this 
usually I have this extreme mix of like some of the best and brightest kids I've ever had. And some kids I'm like, how did you even get into my classroom? Um, you know, and the whole gambit in between, you know, and I've taught 30 kids from like the best of the best to the kid who had to make, you know, a 77 on my final exam to pass my class. He did thankfully, but you know, I've, I've had that extreme and we have to teach that. And so with student driven pacing, what I'm saying is essentially what the name says that I'm assessing student understanding as I go through a unit and I'm using that to determine how fast I go. And so it's all about assessing as we go along. It's really critical. Um, anytime I see confusion, I'm addressing it. Because if I've got a decent chunk of my classroom that's getting confused, then I need to take a step back and I need to be checking in on them. And when I say I'm assessing them through the unit, I do not mean, that could mean, but I, usually, I don't do it this way. You could do a bunch of homeworks. You could do a bunch of quizzes. You could grade all these sorts of things, but that's not what I mean. Um, we're gonna look at my favorite strategy here in a second um, of using class time to assess them. But for me, it's, it's asking questions and interacting with them and checking in on them. And, and I am checking homework and I do give quizzes and those are an assessment tool. But a lot of it is, is a lot more fluid and organic than that. That I'm always on the lookout. I always have my eyes and ears open assessing where my kids are. You know, because it's not just enough for me to teach the information. I also need to be aware of what's going on with them. And I'm always scoping out what's going on and how are they doing? Do I see confusion? Do I see boredom? Do I see distraction? You know, I'm always looking out for these things. And if you're a first year teacher, don't stress too much. That comes with time. It's a skill to be developed. Um, but that's what I'm doing. Um, and then I don't move on until my students are ready. And now this has come up previously also in other workshops, but I'm don't, when I say this, I mean every willing student. Sometimes you get that kid who just isn't willing to learn. And no matter what you do, they're going to just balk and they're going to refuse to work. You can talk to the administrators, you can bring in parents, and they're just going to be, eh, I ain't doing it. You know, and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, but what I am saying is every willing student, we should be able to help them along the way. And you're sometimes going to have those slow kids who class time's just not enough. And you're going to have to tell them to come in before school, during study hall, during lunch, whatever they need to do to kind of help them stay afloat of where they need to be. And that's part of assessing and, and making those comments to those kids. Um, and I kind of, if I can get all of my willing kids and all of my kids who, you know, if a, if a kid is falling behind and I tell them to come in and they choose not to come in, I can't be responsible for that. I've got to move on at some point, but I'm giving them every chance I can to help them along the way. And that's part of not moving on until they're ready. So for me, a lot of people are like, well, but then you're going too slow. You'll never finish the year. I guarantee you that if you take the time to do this, it'll pay dividends in the long run. And for me, the classic example is this. Um, I teach conversions right before I do mole conversions. I don't teach at the beginning of the year. I teach it right before I start moles. And I will spend an extra day or two on conversions, making sure my kids can convert anything. If I give them whatchamacallits to doohickeys to gobbledygooks, they can convert that if I give them conversion factors. And I actually, literally, I think I have a question on the test, and it's like convert A to E. Uh, three A's equals two B's, and five B's equals seven C's. And I have all these conversion factors, and they convert it. And they're just learning that you, know, you just get the units in the right places and everything works and they understand the method. If my kids understand conversions and then I add mole conversions to it, all I'm doing is adding some new conversion factors. And they know how to do conversion factors, it's easy. I can honestly teach mole unit, I can teach them mole conversions, I can teach them uh, percent composition, and I can teach them determining empirical molecular formulas, just a little over a week um, because they've gotten conversion down so well, they just hop right through it. Same thing with stoichiometry. That stoichiometry, they, it's, I'm just adding a new step, mole to mole. They're so comfortable with mole conversions now that when I add this new mole to mole step, they're like, boom, I can do that. You know, and so it's all about you're, 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 you're playing the long game when you do student-driven pacing. 
you're laying a good foundation so that you can build on it more quickly and more securely as you go along. Because what happens if you do the opposite? If you, if you don't give kids a good foundation, they try to do mole conversions and they're still flipping conversions half the time and getting them upside down. They're going to be missing a lot of your mole conversions. Then you try to move on to mole conversions while they're still messing up. I mean, try to move on to stoichiometry while they're still messing up mole conversions and you want to pull out your hair. And it's just not worth the pain. I'd rather take a little extra time and make it easier for all of us because the harder it gets, the you know, more confusion they're having down here, the more likely they are just to say, forget this. I'm out of here. You know, they may not leave your classroom, but they left your classroom. Their brain did. Um, and so that's important. All right. So for me, one of the key tools to do student-driven pacing is this, is constant assessment. And so I don't have time to grade every homework assignment, and I'm not going to put comments on homework assignments because the kids aren't going to read them. The only kids that are going to read comments that I write on my homework assignments are the kids who did well on them to begin with. Everybody else is like, oh, I made a 75. All right. They don't look at a single thing I wrote on the paper. They just put it in their notebook. You know, and we're dealing with 16, 17, 18 year olds. It's not like their parents are going, well, hopefully not. Their parents are most likely not going through their notebooks and looking at the comments and making them go back through it again. Um, that's just not happening. Um, if it hasn't happened for the first nine years of their, nine, 10 years of their school career, it's not happening now. Um, and so, and also, I think multiple quizzes, it just eats into class time, it eats into my instructional time. And so, what I do is for skill based lessons, I only teach about half to two thirds of the class, and then I give the rest of the time for them to work on work. Because here's the deal I can teach and do a bazillion examples on how to do conversions on the board. But I can't learn, they're not gonna learn that by watching me do that. Just like I can't learn to play guitar by watching somebody else play guitar. I need to pick up a guitar and play it. That's the only way I'm going to learn. In the same way, with a skills based lesson, like determining protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom, doing electron configurations, nomenclature, reactions, um, conversion, stoichiometry, calorimetry questions, gas laws. I do a really short lesson. I say, hey, here's the basic framework of how to do it, and I'm not going to do a bunch of examples on the board. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give them the work so that they can practice it, because that's how they're going to learn it. And I don't want them going home and doing it at home without my help and practicing it wrong. You know, because that's what I run into, because they'll go home and or what I used to run into. They would go home, do it wrong, and then I've got to unteach the wrong and then reteach the right. And I'm just making more work for myself. And I, I came up with this idea and it's been beautiful for me. And so when they're working, I'm walking around and I'm assessing. I'm helping. Um, my first priority is my weak kids and my quiet kids. You know, it's, I got 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes to walk around the class and do this. I don't have time to check in on everybody. Um, so I got to prioritize um, who I'm helping. And then I focus, like I said, focus on the weak kids. And I definitely allow peer tutoring because once again, I'm not going to get to everybody. But I've got to train my bright kids on how to do peer tutoring. I've got to train my bright kids. Do not just give them the answer. Do not let them copy your paper. You know, that's cheating. This may be a classwork assignment, but that's still cheating. You know, and I'm, and I'm going to drive that home, and I'm going to teach my bright kids how to peer tutor. Um, some of them have that natural gift of teaching. Some of them don't. Um, some of them don't have the patience for it. And I'm like, if you don't have the patience for it, that's fine. You don't have to do this. I'm just asking you to. Um, but I do encourage peer tutoring. Because um, sometimes... Just hearing somebody say it differently than how I said it is all they need to hear, to understand. All right. Um, my third big strategy. I'm all about having an interactive classroom. And by that, I don't mean technology. I don't mean all the bells and whistles. That's not my personality. Um, I don't know if you can get the sense of it. I am not that bubbly, energetic teacher who's smiling all the time. And that's just not me. Um, I definitely tend toward the sarcastic end of the spectrum and can be a little snarky um, and that kind of thing. I tend to be silly. That's my sense of humor. Um, I joke around with my kids. I tend to be fairly relaxed when I'm teaching, but I want an interactive classroom. And for me, what that means is that means dialogue. Okay. And by dialogue, I don't just mean, here's my question. Kid gives me answer. It's right. I move on. 
A um, couple of things first. One, um, my default method is I always default to how I was taught, um, which was lecture. And so if I don't help myself, I can get up there and talk the whole period. And so what I started doing early in my teaching career is I started writing my questions into my notes. And I would highlight them in gray to kind of visually help me see them so that I would stop um, and actually give them that information. So like I would script the, lecture, the questions into my notes and then I would ask them. And then this is a method, once again, I never, I never learned this in school. It's something I just kind of figured out along the way is, remember I said that assessing is really important and that's really the information I need. I need to always be assessing where my kids are. So pretty much every time I ask a question, my, I'm following it up with why after they give me an answer. And at first, my kids are going to freak out because they're like, did I get it wrong? I'm like, no, I'm not saying you got it right. And I'm not saying you got it wrong. I'm asking you why that's the answer. Because here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to look not just at the answer, but their understanding underneath the answer. And so by asking why, I'm looking underneath the hood. And I'm like, hey, do you really understand why that's the answer? You know, like let's say we're doing uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom. And I ask how many electrons are in iron, and somebody says 26. And I'm like, why? Um, well, because it's, uh, it's a neutral atom, so protons and electrons are equal. I'm like, great, thank you. You understand. But if somebody says 26, and they're like, um, because that's how many neutrons there are, then I know they don't understand. They said the same answer, but I need to go back and kind of help them with it. Um, and then I can interact with them and, and, and we'll get to this kind of talk about it a little bit later, but I'm not going to get to it as deep as I want to, but be safe with them when they make mistakes or be safe with a kid who doesn't understand when I ask why and they're like, I'm not sure, or I don't know the answer to one-on-one. -on -one, I mean, not one-on-one, -on -one, but essentially one-on-one. -on -one. No other kids are allowed to raise their hand. No other kids are allowed to interject. I'm working with that kid directly to help them get to the right answer. Um, and so working with them that way. And I think that's critical. All right. Chemistry is wacky. I mean, there's just no way around it. Chemistry is, I'm still convinced, especially when you throw labs and lab prep into it. I think labs, chemistry is the hardest prep that you can have in high school. Um, I've taught pre-cal, I've taught algebra two, I've taught physics, and I still think chemistry is the toughest one. Um, and it's tough for us as teachers, it's really tough for kids. You know, it can sometimes sound like we're speaking a foreign language. And the kids just can't follow that. And so they get confused. And once again, confusion equals enemy of engagement. And so it's critical that we use illustrations, things they already know, to help them along. So, you know, if you're talking about stoichiometry, you know, to you, it's obvious that they're using mole conversions. And that these are just like the conversions they just did. Make it explicit. Just make it very, very important. Hey, remember the mole conversions we just did? That's what we're doing here. You know, um, or you're doing ions. And they're like, well, but it's so different than how we did neutral atoms. I'm like, no, it's not. You do this one little change. It's essentially the same. You know, tied to prior knowledge. Um, and it can be prior knowledge of things outside of the chemistry classroom. Um, and that's kind of how illustrations work in my mind. Um, when I'm trying to teach limiting reactants, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to be like, hey, you got 10 pieces of bread and eight slices of cheese. If you're doing one slice of cheese per sandwich, how many sandwiches can you make? And the kids can figure that out. They're like, oh, five sandwiches. I'm like, why? Well, I ran out of bread. I'm like, okay. And then I go and describe. I said, all right, we ran out of bread. And so it limited how much we could make. And this is what we actually made. We made five sandwiches. All right, do we have some cheese left over? Yeah, we had three slices of cheese left over. Okay, so the three slices of cheese are in excess, right? Okay, and so I, I use those terminology and I use those words specifically because then I went, oh, so this we would call the limiting reactant. This one we call the excess reactant. And this one we call the actual yield. You know, this is your yield. This is what you made, okay? Um, and I'm using those terms with them, but I'm tying it to an illustration to give them information to hang their hats on. That's what this, this, this strategy is all about. It's about giving them things to hang their hats on. Okay? 
um, like I said, make explicit converse, uh, any connections, make them explicit so they can see it. All right. To me, this is a big one, uh, especially with chemistry. We must ensure that our class is a safe space. And I know that, that around politics and everything, that's kind of a loaded term these days, but it's still the best way to describe what I'm saying. Um, learning is a process where you go from not knowing to knowing. And especially for some of your brighter students, maybe not your best and brightest, because they're still probably getting chemistry pretty easily, but you're gonna have this group of kids, and this is gonna be the first class where they don't go from not, they, they're used to going from not knowing to knowing like this. And they're so used to it just being quick and easy. By the end of the period, they got it, they move on. But all of a sudden, they're like, I'm not there. I'm here. I failed. I'm stupid. I can't learn this. I can't do this. They start freaking out. I've seen it so many times over the years. You know, and that it's like, all right, whoa, 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 slow down. It's okay. You're not in my class because you know how to do chemistry. You're in my class because you don't know how to do chemistry. That's okay. Calm down. And let's look what we're going to do. Just give me some time. You know, and so giving, the, you know, giving them permission to struggle a little bit, giving them permission that it may take a day or two or even three days for them to get a hang of a new skill is huge. Because once again, I'm making it safe for them to be confused a little bit without it going all the way to anxiety. Because because I'm doing a couple of things. One, I'm giving them permission to be confused, which is huge. Two, I am communicating as clearly as I can that I am for them and I am with them. That I'm not going to leave them their side until they're ready. And I'm not going to give them a quiz or a test until they're ready as a group. Once again, I have individuals that need to come in for extra time and so on. But as a group, if they know that, because I'll have kids like freak out, so like, Mr. Anderson, we're not going to be ready for this. I'm like, guys, slow down. Have I ever given you a test where I haven't made sure you were ready? No. So what makes you think I'm going to do that to you this time? Calm down, relax, and let's keep working on it. Now I'm going to make sure you understand this before we move on. You know, it's, it's amazing what that does for kids, that if they know that if I am with them and for them, they're going to keep working for me. Because I, I have this firm belief, like if student-driven pacing is my main philosophy on how I teach, my main philosophy on how I relate to my students is this. If I win their hearts, I will win their minds. If I win their hearts, I will win their minds. If my students know that I am with them, if my students know I am for them, they're gonna stay engaged. They're gonna be willing to push through the hard to get where we need to go. Because they know they're not on it all about all on their own. They know that I'm with them, they know that I'm for them. And that's critical. You know, you know, teaching them that mistakes are not about failure, but about learning from them and correcting them. Um, I love the illustration of like a guided missile or a guided torpedo. Like when it gets off course, it doesn't like explode saying, oh, I failed. It corrects its course and keeps going. You know, like if a homing pigeon gets turned around, it doesn't just stop flying. It will make a correction and get where it needs to go. Um, and that's kind of how we need to do learning. And that's what I want them to understand. You know, and letting know, each student know they're valued, like the troublemaker. He's valuable in my class. The quiet kid, he's valuable in my class. The weak kid, he's valuable in my class. When I can like interact with them in between class periods and ask them genuine questions and be genuinely interested in their response and building those relationships with them, all of a sudden, once again, I'm winning their hearts and I'm going to win their minds. They're going to be engaged in class. It's huge that how we teach is very well followed by how we relate to our kids. Um, and this is a big one for me. When I'm asking questions, I give my space, give them space and time to answer. So when I asked Johnny, 
to answer a question and he's confused and doesn't have it right. And then all my eager beavers are raising their hand. I'm just like, put your hands down. I'm going to work with Johnny through this. And then I'm going to sit there and I'm going to give Johnny all the nonverbals he needs to know that I'm with him and for him and that we're not in a hurry. And that I'm not going to let the other kids jump in. I'm not going to let the other kids interrupt. I'm not going to let the other kids like, you know, because what happens if a kid doesn't understand and then I call on the kid who does understand, all I've done is reinforce that that kid doesn't understand. And if he says he doesn't understand, all of a sudden he feels like he's confused and he doesn't belong there and he's checking out. And I love Johnny too much to let that to happen. So I'm going to sit with Johnny in front of the whole class and we're going to work through it. I'm going to backtrack through his thinking and understanding. And I'm kind of do kind of like when I do partial credit on a test. I'm looking for where they made the mistake. And so I'm, I'm discussing with Johnny where his mistakes is. And then I'm working Johnny back up to the correct answer. And not only have I just helped Johnny now believe he can do it, which is huge. I am certain that Johnny's not the only one who had that problem. And I've helped other kids see it too. But it's not just the right answer. It's, it's like helping them get from not understanding to understanding. And that's fundamental. Uh, like I said, <laughs> win their hearts. Um, it is, it's amazing. Um, I'm gonna go into that in a lot more depth in two weeks when I talk about how to make teaching teens a delight. Because if we win their minds, I mean, sorry, we win their hearts. Um, teenagers are a lot of fun, um, in my opinion, um, when you get them on your side. All right, this is a new one. This is one that's been a real big area of growth for me for the last mm, probably four or five years, maybe a little bit longer, is creating a culture of celebration. So, we celebrate things that are important to us. You know, think about how you feel if somebody misses your birthday. You feel like they don't care about you. Um, and so kind of to take that and reverse it, like we, when people do remember your birthday, you feel important, you feel seen, you, see, you feel valued. And I want to do that in our classroom because if we don't do it, then our kids decide what's important. And I think when we celebrate, that helps us to identify what's important in class. And by celebrating, I do not mean, yay, woohoo, you made 100 on a test. Um, once again, that's not my personality. I'm not that person. Um, I'm not gonna do that. What I mean by celebrating is bringing attention to, speaking it out. Um, and for me, what's important for me isn't kids making A's on test. Um, what's important to me is kids growing um, and showing growth. And so. Like for the early part of my teaching career, um, you know, really first two thirds, if a kid you know, normally doesn't turn in his homework and all of a sudden he hands in two in a row and he like kind of looks at me like that he wants some like high five kudos from me, I just would have been like, dude, you're just doing what you're supposed to do. What do you expect from me? For a normal kid, that may be true, but for this kid, maybe him turning in homework two times in a row is huge. Let me acknowledge it. Let me say something like, dude, thank you for turning in homework two times in a row. I am proud of you, thank you. That's celebrating. You've acknowledged and brought to the light that he's done something good, and that kid needs to hear that. You know, I think of a girl I had three years ago. Um, she started kind of mid-low C range beginning of the year, and she just worked hard, worked hard, worked her way all the way up to low A range by the end of the year. And I pulled her aside after class one day, and I was just like, I am so proud of you. I have seen you grow, and you have worked your tail off, and look where you've gotten to. And her face just beamed. And the next day, I was on carpool duty out in the parking lot, and I saw her mom picking her up. And I went out to the car and took a few moments to tell her mom the exact same thing. And see her mom light up, to see that girl light up was awesome. Because that's what's important. You know, that kid who usually makes a C on a test to make a low B, it's like, awesome, dude, you did it. Invest in them. In, I mean, because what celebrating does, is it, it goes back to winning their hearts. It's like, I see you. What teenager doesn't want to be seen? What teenager doesn't want acknowledgement for where they've been busting their butt and working hard 
and something good actually happened. Because so many of these kids, all they hear is like when they do something wrong. And so they start building their beliefs around the wrong things, the bad things that they get taught, told about, instead of building their beliefs around the good things. They start believing, I'm always going to be a CD student. I'm never going to be a B student. I'm like, no, no, no. See, you made a B. Let me speak into that. Um, and that comes up to another one that we'll talk about in a little bit called limiting beliefs. These kids believe things that are wrong, like I can't do math. So when a kid who says, I can't do math, does math, celebrate it. Point it out. Show them, hey, look at that. Awesome, dude. Way to go. You know, or whatever works for you, whatever your teaching personality style is, make it work for you. Um, all of y'all aren't going to be like me. Um, your personalities are different. And then be empowered, because every day is a school day. Um, that really helps us to keep kids engaged when we are consistent. Every day is a school day. Um, you know, I'm all about, you know, like you hear my person, I like interacting with my kids. I like being that mentor, that friend's the wrong word. I'm not a friend with my kids. Um, and that's where I want to really go with that is I'm, a, I'm not their friend. I'm a mentor. I'm speaking into their lives. I'm relating. I'm interested in their lives. But at the end of the day, I'm the teacher. I'm still the authority in the classroom. And to be honest with you, kids will respond well to that. You know, they have their peers, you know, and I'm not supposed to be their peer. I'm an adult who's speaking into their lives. I'm the adult who's interested and valued in them and sees them. And then also my authority, I give them structure to be safe in, in my classroom. And so part of how I exert my authority and keep them safe is every day is a school day. Um, I'm prepped every day. I'm prepped with the content. I'm prepped with how to communicate it. And I'm, and I'm ready to go relationally. If that means at the end, beginning of the day that I need to kind of like really do some work to calm myself down, you know, like if my wife and I had to blow up the night before or something's happened with my family that I just need to, you know, sometimes I have to do that. Or sometimes I have to, I mean, it just strongly depends on what class you have. But there have been times where I was just having a really bad day. Um, like when my father was battling cancer years ago. You know, and just having conversation with the kids like, guys, I'm having a rough day today. So just if I'm a little bit more on edge and a little bit shorter temper with you, I apologize beforehand. Um, but just I just want you to know. And because I built those relationships with those kids, they generally respond fairly well and they understand that. Um, and that's the kind of dynamic I'm looking for. Um, Clear and enforced rules, like I said, that's also just once again exerting my authority. Here's a big one that I don't think gets talked about enough. The big themes that you're going to hear, especially here at the beginning of the school year, is like, oh, you pour out your life for your kids. If you keep pouring out your life, you're not going to be, you don't, gonna, yeah, you're not going to have anything to give. You keep burning both can the candle at both ends, you're soon no longer going to be a candle. It's critical that we take care of ourselves. Because like, so for, for example, this, the idea of creating a culture of celebration, that's come from my personal growth. That's come from me realizing that I don't, I come from a family where we didn't celebrate things very much. And, and I needed to grow in that area. As I grew into it, I saw that I needed to grow it, that in my classroom. You know, and that's important to speak into those things and to give voice to those things. And that's come out of my own personal growth. And, you know, when I'm grounded and when I'm well, when I've, when I've gone to the gym and I've worked out, when I've been eating well and not, you know, eating sugary crud and I'm well hydrated, I teach better. When I've had good time with my family and my friends, I teach better. Um, because there's more me present. Um, and that's critically important that we take care of ourselves and we seek to grow ourselves. Not as, when I say personal growth here, I don't mean growing as a teacher. I mean just growing as a person, maturing as a person. Um, part of my growth is, you know, I'm married to a therapist, but she's not my therapist. No, no that's a good boundary we have. But I go to my own therapist, and I've been to several different therapists to help myself grow, because they see things in me that I'm, I'm blind to, you know, shortcomings that I need help with that I may or may not see. Um, and it's helped me grow as a person and made me a much stronger, better 
teacher. I've got kind of like podcasts that I listen to that are there to encourage and help me on my mindset and in my own personal growth because it makes me a better teacher. All right. And really, you got to take action. You know, even with just the areas we've covered, you know, pick one or two of these and take action on them. Um, or a couple of the other things we're going to hit very, very quickly. You know, you take action on these things and you put them into practice. And, you know, for me, I would always pick one or two things every semester. I'm like, hey, this is my goal for this semester. And then I try to put it into practice. You know, like if you look at all of this stuff and you try to implement all of this, you know, next week or whenever your school starts, you're going to overwhelm yourself. It's just not possible. It's taken me 15 years plus to learn all this and to put it into practice and to perfect it, or at least get to the level I'm at as never perfected. Um, so give yourself time, give yourself patience, but take action. Uh, don't let the overwhelm stop you. Just pick one or two things and take action. All right, so other things to consider. Um, classroom management, we talked about that last week. Um, how you interact with teens, that's the workshop in a couple of weeks. The relationship with your students drives so much of what goes on in your classroom. It is so critical, it's so important. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to be at that workshop on the 17th. Okay. Challenging limiting beliefs. Um, you know, just you got, you got to address those. When kids say that I can't do math, showing them when they do do math. But it's going to take time, and you have to do it gently, and you have to do it over and over and over again. Um, and eventually, they start to believe more and more that they can't actually do math. Um, they believe that they don't have to be the troublemaker. They believe that they don't have to be the C student. Um, these things take time, um, but it's doable. You know, kids believe that, you know, they stop believing they have to be the shy kid. And they believe that it's safe to ask questions. Um, these are all limiting beliefs that hold kids back. Um, that hold them back from being as actively engaged and learning the way that they can to their fullest potential. And so those are important. And then, you know, another thing, just I think giving kids alternative assessments is a great way of helping with them be engaged, especially for your kids who are not your standard auditory learners. Because most school is designed for auditory learners. Um, teacher gets up, speaks. Um, it helps visual kids do okay. But I think auditory kids generally do the best. And then your poor kinesthetic kids are just left out, you know. But if we can come up with alternative assessments, and I'm not saying like every unit has an alternative assessment. I'm saying, you know, for me, it's I shoot for at least one a semester where I'm helping kids express what they know in a different way um, to help get engaged those kids who aren't necessarily traditionally great students. 